Okay, I think we should start. We have a lot to talk about and we have uh, four great uh, speakers. So my name is uh, Alejandro Abram. I'm a lecturer in journalism in the media school of LCC. And it's my pleasure to chair this Digital Cultures and Economic uh, Economies Research Hub Seminar, which is entitled Digital Transformations and the Public Good. And I'm very happy to, um, to be sharing this with four colleagues. And um, I really look forward, just as I said, to, to listen to what they have to say. So we are going to have four presentations. Uh, most of them will last between 12 and 14 minutes, uh, says my brief. I'll make uh, an announcement when there are four minutes left on, uh, on each uh, presentation. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have uh, at least half an hour uh, for a Q&A session. So please keep uh, kind of a pen or just make a note of your questions that you have so that you can uh, present them to the panel or to individ individual speakers at the end. And uh, now I'll introduce the speakers. So this is also the order in which the presentations will, will follow. So, so Tanya Suyon is the program director of the communication and media program in the media school at London College of Communication. And so specializes in social media, emerging technologies, platforms, and everyday life. Her presentation will be followed by Berfin Emer Setin, who is a senior lecturer in communication and media program also at LCC. And her research focuses on the relationship between ethnicity, religion, migration, and media. Sara Marino is a senior lecturer in communication and media and an acting course leader for the MA in media communications and critical practice also here at LCC. And uh, her research explores the relationship between media, transnational spaces and migrant identities. And finally, Rebecca Bramal is a reader in cultural politics at London College of Communication. And um, her research explores the relationship between culture and economy with a current focus on fiscal imaginaries. So as, as you can see, there is uh, quite a lot of kind of uh, connection between these speakers. Um, it is because they are together in this hub. So hopefully we can kind of um, flesh out some interesting points of agreement or perhaps also disagreement. So as I said, try to keep your questions uh, to the end. And if there is any kind of um, connecting question that perhaps the entire panel can answer, that will be, that'll be great. So we'll start with you, So um, if you can share your screen. We cannot hear you yet. It, it seems I can't speak and share my screen. <laughs> um, would it be possible uh, for Joanne to share the screen? Because my microphone tells me it's disabled. Joanne, is that, is that possible you can share my slides? I did send them, them earlier. Um, I can try one more time uh, and hopefully that will work this time. Apologies, everyone. Uh... Okay, we can see now your screen and you might need to unmute yourself first. I can't, I can't unmute. When I go to share the screen, it says your microphone is not available <laughs> um, that happens. in the test, in the test section. So, um, I know Tommaso does have a copy of the slides, but what I can do, um, we I'm could also, sure. if you, if you prefer so, uh, and if Befin is happy with it, we can give you some time to get ready, and we can start with the next uh, talk. Would that be okay? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll see if uh, Tommaso can share my slides for me while Barfin goes. That would be great. Thank you so much. And apologies. Excellent. No, don't worry. These things happen. So Barfin, you're up. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, let me again try sharing my screen. Hmm. That's funny. Okay, I can share my desktop. I think you can see my desktop, though. I don't know whether this is the best for you. Yeah, all good. Shall I go ahead? I'm going to yep. make it full screen. I can still see you, so I'm hoping that everybody's able to see the see the screen. 
So we can thank see you and hear okay. So okay. We'll, I, I'll, I'll let you know four minutes before the end. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Well, thank you so much um, to everyone who has been able to make some time for our, um, for our talks today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the, the relationship between minorities and digital divides and how um, we can think of this um, body of research or um, the concept more broadly in the context of minorities. Um, of course, this stems from my existing research on Alevi media. Um, for those who are not familiar who the Alevis are, I'll begin by introducing them and try to um, talk about the significance of their media for themselves as a community, for the broader Turkish community, but as well for, for us researchers in terms of understanding different dynamics of transnationalism, community media um, in contemporary global and, and digital world. So Alevis are um, the second largest religious group in Turkey. According to some, they're a different religion um, than of a Muslim. According to some, they're considered as a sect, as a different interpretation. So there are different debates, and the, these are highly politicized debates in defining what Alevism is. But more importantly, they're a persecutors community, and they haven't been um, officially recognized as a community in Turkey, despite their their right claims. And um, it's important to emphasize that in the Europe, especially in countries such as Germany and more recently in the UK, they are considered as a, as a distinct religious community. Um, so there are 15 to 20 million um, Alevis living in Turkey. And this, these numbers are, again, um, estimated numbers because of the persecution, oppression, and um, all other issues. It's not um, possible to pinpoint the exact number living in Turkey. This is also the case um, in Germany. Recently in the UK, Alevis are again included in the census. So hopefully we'll have an idea of how many Alevis um, live in the UK, um, a clearer idea. But um, if you look at the, um, the numbers that we can derive from the um, community centers, um, it's four to six thousand um, hundred in Germany, hundred thousand in Germany, and three hundred thousand in the UK. So I was interested in um, Alevi TV stations because, interestingly, Alevis have been an um, have been an oppositional group in Turkey, so quite um, sh shaping the politics in Turkey. But unlike other communities such as Kurdish and others, they have entered this media arena quite late. And they have established their TV channels, um, especially satellite channels, in, in late 2000s. And um, the TV stations have been particularly important because they shaped Alevi politics, they um, sustained the transnational um, 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 connections and, and links um, for quite, quite a long time. And um, these stations were available in the form of satellite until 2016 um, coup that I sent in Turkey, which ended up, as many um, of you might be aware of, in, in oppression of the over different voices um, across the broader spectrum of Turkish media. And this has been the result for Alevi stations as well. And as a result of this, and then later, um, of course, again, as we have all experienced the, the pandemic, these stations had to switch to online. And um, so my research, which was aiming at focusing the TV stations, ended up um, capturing this um, shift from satellite to online. And so I, I came across with lots of different questions, research questions, as, I, as my, my um, research moved on in terms of understanding the relationship between traditional media, digital media, and how that um, shift or force shift, if you like, from traditional to digital impact the understanding of the community, self-definitions, the boundary making, and all um, different aspects in relation to migration and transnationalism. And maybe at this point, I should also emphasize that these TV stations have been established in Germany. So that, um, although they, they primarily aim at addressing the audience in Turkey. So it's, a, it's quite a complex relationship that we're talking about in terms of um, embedding different national contexts. So um, 
And I have developed my research as an ethnographic study, including the audience, the production, um, as I was interested in how Alevis um, are constructing their transnational um, public affair, um, thanks to television. But here, as you might um, already seen um, or, or drawn your attention to, I, as my research has moved on, I shifted from the concept of television to the media because of this reinforced digitization, if you like, or moved to the digital um, by the circumstances in which Alevis were, um, were occupying. Um, and um, I have been on sabbatical to write up my, my book, um, my research on Alevis. And as a result, I came up with, uh, with this concept of transversal citizenship. So again, this um, idea of transnational public affair and transnational um, right claims um, ended up being insufficient for understanding the Alevi context as um, I moved on analyzing the programs, talking to audience, doing research with the producers, I came to realize that there are different levels um, in relation to right claims, but in relation to how Alevism has been um, constructed. So I came up with this idea of transversal citizenship, which embeds different um, levels of spaces, including local, national, transnational, um, and depending on what sort of right claims that Alevis make, we can um, we are able to um, see different levels um, interplay uh, at an interplay. Um, so, to to sum up very briefly, um, and hoping to um, open up later with the Q and A's, I can define transversal citizenship in, in three respects. The first one is is about mediation and how right claims. Um, are made in and through media. In media, in the form of media activism and through media, all sorts of different right claims, um, which are not necessarily um, cultural right claims, are also made through media. And um, as I've already actually mentioned, um, transversal citizenship is about embedding different spatial contexts in, in citizenship claims. And depending on where people are situated, um, these um, claims uh, might include some specific transnational contexts or might be regional, including the idea of Europeanness or, or Balkan um, identities. Um, and more importantly, I think, um, transversal citizenship is about understanding this mediated construction of, of um, citizenship and making right claims through media. Um, as a decolonizing practice and understanding that as a decolonizing practice, rather than situating this right claims in the context of media, media studies, media histories, I thought it's quite crucial to, um, to make sense of the history of the community first in order to understand how this particular form of citizenship is enacted. And that's why I have been able to um, realize that Transversal citizenship can be a useful concept for understanding um, stateless um, communities or stateless nations, Alevis being one of them, um, the communities. So how am I going to wrap this up? I'm a bit um, nervous in terms of time as well. Um, I have recently asked um, TV producers um, about how this shift has impacted them from traditional to, to the digital. And they have provided me with lots of in significant data. And this is, um, this is um, one of the TV stations Facebook page where they actively draw on in um, accessing audience through um, social media. Um, a few points that I want to make in order to take all this um, complex research in the context of digital divides. As you can see through the numbers and statistics here, they're in German, um, apologies for that. I haven't been able to um, um, translate them, but a quarter of their audience are, are female on the Facebook, which is their main domain in accessing audience through social media. 
And again, um, if you look at the location of the audience and where they're from, Turkey is, is quite substantial. And there's a huge difference between um, more developed um, cities in Turkey, such as Istanbul, Izmir, and Ankara, and more, more um, remote regions. And majority of the Alevis now are settled in these um, cities, but they have um, they have origins in the in the rural part of Turkey. And um, TV stations originally had a had a great job in giving voice to that rural communities and um, making their um, Alevis invisible, if you like. And um, one minute, very fine. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna rush. So. This is that, and I can open up this later on. But how how this this helps me to see um, the digital divides? Obviously, when I discuss this with the audience and with the um, with the TV producers, um, I came to realize that in the digital sphere, these um, Alevi stations are able to um, access different sort of audience. But what does that mean? I think it means that. Digital devices can translate into the context of minorities quite in specific ways, where local and national contexts do really matter. So when we ask the, the seminal question of equalities of thought um, in, in the context of digital, I think minorities can be seen through a different lens than, um, than what digital, what studies on digital divides. Um, so far suggest in terms of focusing on macro and micro processes. And I think it's quite important to shift um, from an understanding of users as individuals um, to users as and, and in communities and try to consider them as part of something, a greater um, body, a greater social body in which um, communicating with others and engaging with digital um, hold the same importance or significance. And of course, I think this has been um, questioned by, by Halsby's study on digital inequalities recently, um, but intersectionality is quite important for understanding digital divides um, and how they are experienced um, by minorities. And as you have seen in the previous slide, there's a huge gender divide in terms of how um, people who, who are associated with, uh, with a female or male identity, female identity and male identity, there's a huge discrepancy, which might not necessarily be case in the traditional um, version of Alevi, um, Alevi media. Again, the localities and access seem to be a great issue, which is again, I think reinforcing the gender divides that we have among audience. Um, regulation and censorship, um, is quite a tricky part in terms of how actually I'm going to move to the next slide to, to contextualize this a bit better and I'm hoping to open up this again later via questions and answers but national context and how um, say Turkish state is regulating YouTube makes quite a big difference or social media makes quite a big difference um, for different TV stations and how they online stream and how actually um, self-censorship employed by, by um, workers working for the YouTube based in Turkey um, can, are, is able to make a huge difference for, um, in terms of um, how say a Kurdish Alevi TV channel might be censored by YouTube because of um, their, their politically um, a marginalized situation than a, a more like a mainstream Alevi station. So in terms of understanding then divides and digital divides, it's really important to take these national and local contexts into account. However, when we look at the digital divide literature more broadly, the concept of divides is highly questioned. People come up with different ideas, but digital remains unquestioned, which I find I found a bit problematic as a result of probably being able to identify this shift from traditional to digital. So I think it's we might we must come up with a critique of how digital can be used as an umbrella term, whereas national contexts and user contexts in terms of intersectionality and different um, locations the users are situated 
actually do really matter on a on a community level as well, not on, on an individual level. Yes, and Finn, thirty seconds. Okay, so the one thing, the more important thing, um, I think, is that is the fact that we talk a lot about the difference between online and offline, and this is a way of us to understand to make sense of how digital media works and how digital divides work. But what about the the broader media? We often ignore that, and um, I think that has been a, a, what my my research partially problematizing in terms of thinking about the complex media environment and how people have to switch to different media because of the digital device as a result and draw on different resources. And of course, which indicates, um, I think, public good and the idea of public quite um, matters in the age of this complex media environment where people need to draw on different, um, different forms of media and technologies. Well, thank you so much. And it was a challenge to, to sum up everything in, in 14 minutes. Well, well done. You, I think you've done remarkably well. Thank you so much. OK, so I think we should be able now. Sorry, we should be able now to uh, see So's presentation. I think it might be shared by excellent. OK, so um, again, um, I'll let you know four minutes before and um, take it from there. Great, thank you so much. And really, uh, apologies for um, the technical problems. I've not had that happen before where you share your slides and it says you can't talk. Anyway, glad that that's sorted. And thank you, uh, Tommaso and Joanna, for um, sharing the slides. So could we go to the next slide, speaking of which? Um, so today, what I'd really like to talk about is platforms and how we can think about public goods uh, within relation to the platforms. Oddly, I found myself while preparing for this really consumed with actually notions of public harms and public, we don't say public bads, but the ways in which public good is threatened. Um, and I felt actually that that was really appropriate. Uh, and I think that there's something very important about looking at this, at, at the ways in which there's polarizations and real bifurcation in the, in the public sphere, in the, the realm of everyday action. Um, that we see uh, on platforms, um, on social media and online, just to pick up a point that I think is absolutely crucial, which Barfin mentioned, and that is that you can't, although I'm looking at platforms, they are not separable from, from offline. They, you know, what we see and the things that we see might be amplified or exacerbated, but they are not the cause or root of only online or only platformed types of interaction and structures and infrastructures. They're 100% deeply embedded and woven within the online offline and I think that we must as a starting point take those two um, as embedded. So what I'd like to talk about today is platforms and platform sociality, the opportunities and affordances of platforms for how it is that we are able to connect, disconnect um, uh, and interact. Um, and one of the points I think, and I'm, I have a little picture of my book uh, published last April here, because I think a lot of the research comes from there, but this talk also includes some thinking um, about perhaps the direction I wanna go. So perhaps work in, in development. Um, so one of the things that we can see with platform social, sociality is polarization, is a bifurcation and real differences um, between what we could describe as pro-social, and it's not described necessarily as pro-social in the literature and research that we see, but the kinds of things, the kinds of research that fit into that are decreased barriers for civic expression, for artistic expression, increased connection, and um, as I'll touch on very briefly, a pro-social ideology, that connection is good, that being able to interact with others is good, and this is absolutely uh, promoted and celebrated and pushed, I would say, by platforms. We also see <clears throat> a real rise of antisocial um, kinds of sociality, and that includes the rise of dis and misinformation about polarized publics, but also hate. Uh, and there's a lot of that, um, you know, abuse and harassment and bullying, um, particularly for those who um, are minoritized. We see a lot of that on, online. So I want to talk about how this, you know, bifurcation fits within platform platformization and the rise of platforms. So hopefully in the very end, we can talk about a little bit about public harms to public goods. Can I have the next slides, please? So I just briefly wanted to start with two different definitions of, of platforms, um, drawing from the safety by design, which is a really interesting approach 
to thinking about safer online platforms um, from the government uh, site, you can see that platforms are, they define them as post to user generated content, such as images, videos, and comments. And it's interesting because I think in lots of other literature, you see a movement away from user generated content, but it's powerful that this is still something so relevant in how um, the government are thinking about this. Um, Robin Mansell and Edward Steinmiller talk about a platform as a digital architecture. And I think that this is really important and certainly co um, uh, collaborates or is, you know, fits with the ways in which I'm understanding um, platforms in social media. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So bearing in mind that these are platforms, um, social media mostly take place on platforms. And that means that no platform is a single site or a single mobile app. They are a series of nested um, technolo technologies which fit together either on a site and or mobile app and or platform of many different uh, capacities. Um, so I would argue uh, that these uh, social content on platforms is shaped by multi-sided markets. And what that means is that there is contested influence over how it is that content, what it is that content looks like. Um, and that means we get a multiplicity of buyers and sellers, which are filtered through platforms. We get the audience as product, what Dallas Smythe talked about as the audience commodity. Um, and that's really important because that's not something uh, I think I think it's becoming increasingly known, but it's not something that's necessarily prevalent. We also get the rise of platform empires. You know, Google and Facebook, for example, are just absolutely massive, and as are Amazon um, and Apple. And in the um, in the East, in Asia, we have Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And what we are seeing is the rise of mass datification and extraction. Um, and we can look at some of the really uh, big um, artificial intelligence. Uh, departments within Google and Facebook and Meta, um, but we can also look at the, the multiple ways in which every click turns into capital, every browse, every view, every you know small interaction um, on social media is, is monetized. Um, next slide, please, thank you. So this brings us to social media polarities. And what we see when we look at social media content and we look at kinds of behavior is that there's really good kinds of behavior. Next slide, please. Um, for example, you know, there's lots of work and I haven't included um, names here so much, but you get people like Burgess and Green who talk about YouTube as a platform for, for vernacular creativity. And this is a beautiful term. It's about how it is that people in an everyday way are able to do more for um, how they see the world. They're, they're able to maximize their creative potential in ways that arguably we um, haven't seen to such scale. It's absolutely existed before, but not to such scale. We see increased connection in the image that you see. This is actually an image of Facebook friendships um, around the globe. Um, we can see expanded and rich forms of uh, social movements, you know, Me Too, I Don't Know More, Black Lives Matter. There's, again, increased scope and scale around how these movements are able to mobilize and take place. We also see decreased barriers to civic expression and cultural production, how it is that people are able to, to participate and engage within the public sphere. Um, next slide, please. And if we look at how it is that platforms talk about, you know, what it means to be, um, what it is that they are and what it is that they do, we can see a pro-social ideology. So um, in 2020, I looked at the, I analyzed the About Us and What Is pages for some of the top um, social media platforms. And the word cloud that you see represents those words that are repeated the most. So world, people, everyone, community, share, those are the words that they talk about, about their mission and what they do the most. And I think that's really meaningful. Next slide, please. Others have talked about this pro-social pro uh, paradigm as an ideology of connection, looking at the language that's used and how it is that we participate on, online, like comment, share, all of these sorts of things mask the ways in which surveillance and data extraction are embedded within these kinds of things. Um, there's some fascinating work which looks at defriending and how difficult it is to break out of this pro-social frame, you know, and anyone who has defriended someone or broken up with someone or had a kind of conflict that they tried to come out of, it just kind of reveals how embedded this ideology of connection is, this, this connective um, context. Next slide, please. And I think that that's actually fascinating uh, to look at the ideology of connection in that way. Can I have the next slide, please? 
thank you. Um, on the other side, we get many examples of how it is that social media are bad. You know, we've got Cambridge Analytica, which exposed um, the data extraction from 80 million, thereabouts, 87 million uh, Facebook users. We've got, you know, the January 6th insurrection, which was has been linked to all kinds of mis and disinformation. Pizzagate, you know, conspiracy theories, uh, Levy U campaigns, which has been linked to Cambridge Analytica. We also have the rise of quite um, scary um, misinformation and disinformation, as we can see with the screenshot from uh, TikTok um, misinformation accounts, which are feeding and promoting uh, misinformation about what's happening with the in Ukraine um, in relation to the uh, uh, Russian invasion now. Next slide, please. We also have got, you know, lots of evidence of all sorts of um, online abuse, uh, you know, toxic Twitter, there's the Amnesty did a, a report looking at the abuse of something like um, 85 women and minoritized uh, public figures and the sorts of, you know, jaw dropping types of abuse that they got. Um, Frances Hogan uh, in the Facebook whistleblower, although she didn't really blow the whistle on anything that was unknown, was able to provide evidence for all sorts of, um, you know, public harms that were taking place via uh, Facebook, including known links around um, the, you know, exposure of young girls to all sorts of negative content around um, thinness and eating disorders that was having a pretty severe impact on mental health. Um, another example is the, you know, the rise of um, far right influencer networks, malevolent influencers on YouTube. And you can see, so in the sense, it's not just content, it's also about the networks of um, abuse and trolling that occur. Um, and all of these are, you know, antisocial. Next slide, please. The thing, minutes, and so. this is becoming, I think, increasingly well known, and this is certainly something that has come out of my own research, but it's just really important to emphasize. Participation is multidirectional, and all platform sociality, sociality, everything we do online via platforms or um, just on the web is monetizable. And it doesn't matter if it's for good or for bad. The longer it, you content keeps you on a particular site, the more profitable it is. And my argument that even in the context of the online safety bill for looking at safety by design, this business model is the problem. And we really need to think about this because media literacy, um, safety by design, all of these other aspects are not going to deal with this fundamental problem that all kinds of sociality, pro or antisocial, um, is something that is profitable. Next slide, please. So, you know, this is, so one of the, the things that we can see when we look at this is that multi-sided markets, how it is that platforms work, the fact that they are responding to that audiences and citizens are the commodity and they have to, you know, platforms are the, are the thing that filter this and um, advertisers and promoters, again, interact with um, platforms to access data, to, um, to effectively determine what kind of content audiences and citizens can consume. What we get is actually, uh, um, we get a skewed public sphere, right? It, to, to say it, I, I guess, in media uh, terms. And that's a real issue. Next slide, please. So when we look at content and how content is determined, that sort of sits on the top of the web. But when we look at uh, platforms, platforms also determine the infrastructure. So they are, I would argue, they, they settle, they, they determine the ways in which we act, um, interact more increasingly in a more dominant way in the social and public sphere than we have seen before. Um, so in that sense, content um, and what we consume is increasingly, you know, the fabric of public and social life, but it's also the actual physical um, infrastructure and architecture. And what that means, next slide please, is that our affordances of behavior, the ways in which we can interact are actually um, determined, influenced, and shaped by these platforms in, in, in really, really powerful ways. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, drawing from the work from Thomas Pohl et al. in their latest book on cultural production, you know, they say the more powerful a platform becomes, the less bargaining power creators and citizens have to de determine, to impact, to shape, to resist, um, and to do all of these sorts of things. And I think that that's really important because it comes back to that business model about it not mattering if it's pro or anti-social um, content or behavior 
or any of these sorts of aspects. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a big point. Um, so next next slide, please. Um, I've tried to be very, very focused in this talk today, and there's it's, it's, it's a real challenge because there's lots of other material and lots of other content, I think, that is really relevant. But for me, I guess to even begin thinking about the role of platforms in a public good in determining a positive um, outcome that's going to support people, limit harms, and really allow users to become citizens, um, there's a lot of challenges. And for me, I was really, really thinking about those challenges and what I think is the loudest about those challenges. And it comes back to that business model. Um, I do think, you know, if we look at Ofcom's uh, Media Nations report, you know, the pandemic and lockdowns have absolutely um, meant a pivot to the digital in ways, you know, television is not the dominant media anymore for the first time, <laughs> I think, in a long time. Um, and I think that this does mean that platforms are in infrastructures for everyday life, but they're also are informational infrastructures. And although we can't separate them from um, offline, I think we have to pay particular attention to their potential, to the affordances, and to the mechanics behind how these infrastructures are shaped, how they're regulated, how um, people are able to interact with them. So, you know, so. The, and Chris, the increased participatory potential is good and bad. And where it's bad, it's really, really bad. Um, and there's no mechanisms to look after that. There's the online safety bill, there's the increase, you know, the digital markets unit, there's all sorts of regula regulation which is being introduced. The one of the big problems of that is that when you have national regulation, it doesn't help with global platforms. And we can see that with the introduction of, um, well, it's just the, you know, the European data protection uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but you know, Facebook's response was to move out of um, Europe and into back into the states. So there's limits with national solutions to global problems. And I think I would say it's not just uh, media literacy, it's not just safety des by design, but the privatization of these infrastructures, their content um, through monetization and economic growth. That is the I think one of the biggest causes of public harm. Um, and this also can be identified in the decrease of platform uh, diversity. We are not seeing new kinds of platforms. We are seeing the growth, the mega growth of uh, a very few platforms. So going forward, I guess my takeaway is building upon this, how it is that participatory potential is both positive and negative. We really, really need not to be, um, you know, not to fall into depression about the ways in which platforms can have a negative impact um, or to over celebrate their positive impact but we really need to interrogate with criticality what these platforms are doing and what the implications are for ourselves as citizens and publics um, another way of putting that it's not just when we think about public good it's not just what is the public good but who is the public good for because we if we listen to platforms they're going to tell us that it's all you know, great uh, in terms of connection and the expansion of uh, very small public spheres. So that's Excellent. all for me. So, Last slide, please. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I mean, we could we could hear the passion, and again, we could hear kind of the relevance and the importance of discussing these um, kind of seriously and taking in consideration not just kind of the the, the perhaps the discourse that comes from these platforms, but also kind of what they do to our the everyday life. I love that the examples that you bring are so um kind of close to the bone really so thank you so okay so we are more or less uh, okay in time we're going to continue now with sarah marino thank you sarah you can share your screen now and again i'll let you know when there are four thank minutes left. thank you thank you and i hope you can see my slides now so um my presentation today focuses on um the ethical challenges posed by the adoption of technologies in humanitarian settings and specifically in the context of the so-called um, refugee crisis. And I'm proposing a new um, framework and set of recommendations that specifically address how we can reconcile the politics of solidarity with the logics that support uh, data collection, data filtering and data use in refugee context. So just to give you a bit of uh, rationale and just to contextualize the uh, reflection I am proposing today, um, these are parts of a larger project which I um, 
started in 2017 uh, and culminating in the publication of my book, which you see here, a screenshot. And this book explores the uh, ways in which political migration management and humanitarian responses to the so-called refugee crisis have been driven by uh, technologies, similarly driven by technologies. And so in the first half of the book, uh, I look at the uh, techno-militarization of uh, Europe and the logics behind the implementation of uh, very sophisticated and very expensive technologies of surveillance to control, to manage, and to stop unwanted migration from um, biometrics to AI-powered um, identification and verification uh, machines to uh, the deployment of drones and cameras and so on and so forth. Um, from the digital border, I then turned um, to the uh, connected or digital refugee as a central figure within Europe's mobility infrastructure, and I specifically look at um, the, um, the use of uh, technological devices, and particularly the smartphone has uh, information devices and connective hubs, and question how devices of these kinds can offer refugees a space where they can communicate, resist, and perform their forced exile. And finally, and this is my main focus today, um, I, I look at how technologies have driven humanitarian calls to action across and despite of borders, and how the so-called tech for social good phenomenon has, phenomenon has rewritten the terms of what it means to distribute solidarity, which I argue it is an example of public good. And so uh, between 2016 and 2019, uh, I interviewed uh, London-based and Silicon Valley-based social entrepreneurs, humanitarians, startuppers, software developers, global volunteer networks. You've got some examples uh, there that I connect here under the very loose term of tech for social good to describe this community of uh, individuals and organizations who believe in the power of technology to bring social change um, and the power of technology to respond to crises more efficiently and more promptly compared to the whole humanitarian model and compared to governments. And in this respect, um, the, the, the Syrian conflict proved quite significant. Um, for this sort of exploration during the eight of the uh, European so-called refugee crisis, hundreds of mobile applications and platforms were created on a daily basis um, to solve refugee protection and integration needs. Um, for instance, through uh, language development apps or education apps or, um, or, or websites that were meant to match needs um, and, and services. Hackathons as well and tech summits were being organized to bring together entrepreneurs, software developers, and in some instances, refugees uh, themselves in order to do something to respond um, to the crisis. And these initiatives have been praised and celebrated um, for their desire um, to improve uh, access and to improve um, access and availability of services and information for refugees. Um, and also, alongside this set of interviews, I interviewed uh, refugees uh, living in London. And what I was really interested in was to interrogate and, and, and call into question the general optimism in the power of technology to disrupt the old humanitarian model and to encourage cross-border solidarity. And I wasn't really interested in the more established partnerships uh, between humanitarian organizations and the tech community, for example, the partnership between UNHCR and Microsoft. I was more interested in uh, smaller initiatives, private, uh, uh, private entrepreneurs, uh, not-for-profit sector, and volunteers um, that have not been looked at uh, as much uh, before. Um, and, and also I was, um, I was interested in looking at not just what opportunities the tech for social good delivers, but also what challenge and what limitations are there. And so the critical question was beyond this techno hype, beyond, behind digital social innovation for refugees, what, what is left? Um, and, and, and then this question was also obviously directed to refugees themselves um, as 
this was kind of a dimension that was often overlooked uh, in, in media studies, in media migration studies. Attention was paid um, to what was being created, but less uh, to the impact of these uh, solutions, of the dig digital solutions for refugees themselves. And so just very briefly, um, uh, my research uncovered lots of opportunities um, behind tech for social good, um, including technologies being an enabler and a vehicle for bigger and bolder changes. Um, technology was praised for the problem solving attitude. Um, many of the uh, entrepreneurs, developers and humanitarians I've interviewed uh, celebrated uh, the empowerment that came through collaboration and through co-creation of knowledge with different communities and refugees themselves. And of course, by definition, technology is future-facing future and uh, sustainable and scalable as well. So many, many opportunities, which of course I want to bear in mind because it's important to keep an open mind. But what I really want to concentrate on for this presentation is, what's not so good about technology for good. And this particularly emerged uh, when I interviewed uh, refugees um, and, and particularly um, talking to them, a whole different perspective came uh, into visibility and with that, the challenges uh, of tech for good. And the first one, the big one is the commodification of the notion of good and social good. Uh, which Hamad uh, brilliantly illustrates uh, in this quote, uh, the transformation of displacement into uh, a problem of connectivity. The, the very problem solving attitude uh, often flattens the complexity uh, of the political, social and cultural conditions of forced migration, uh, the treatment of beneficiaries as, um, as customers. As you can see here, uh, the commodification of humans um, and the importance of likes, number and comments, which lose the human touch. And Hamad is asking, can people ever say they need refugees need to own these platforms and ethical guidelines are essential. And the commodification of good is particularly um, clear in this quote from the co-founder of mobile application I interviewed uh, in 2018. And precisely you see the language here, which is highly problematic when it comes to um, the deployment of technologies in humanitarian settings and contexts of crisis, the focus on the other as a customer. But also the other big issue, and obviously I'm, I'm being very brief now, um, just giving you a glimpse of the many um, limitations of the many challenges, as well as opportunities that tech for social good really brings to the table. Um, but the other bigger question is safety um, and, and security and privacy. And of course, there is a lot of goodwill. There are good intentions, people want to help. But the problem is that more often than not, those entrepreneurs and volunteers who act um, and work uh, from Europe lack understanding of the actual situation on the ground. Personal data can leak, people can be blackmailed, and there are security concerns. And so, um, and so these questions are highly critical when personal data is concerned. Uh, however, data are collected for either for political or humanitarian purposes, especially in a situation where consent is at the very best, very, opa or very opa opaque. And testament to the organizations that I've interviewed, uh, they're all very aware, all the entrepreneurs and volunteers and humanitarians and developers I've reached out to, they're all very aware that this is obviously um, problematic and they're working really hard to minimize risk, risk still, uh, they're still there. And finally, um, one of the other um, software engineers and um, educator I've interviewed um, mentioned is very fascinating notion of ethical coding, um, which is largely missing from humanitarian projects or humanitarian um, briefs. Um, and while in fact, ethical coding should be embedded according to this, uh, to this respondent into recruitment, product design and service design. And I'm arguing that political as well as humanitarian organization need to take that into account if they want to see true to their intention to um, readdress or reorient technologies toward, uh, towards more social needs. One minute, Sarah. And so, thank you. 
And so in thinking about, um, about technology and how we can reconcile the politics of solidarity with the ethics that, and logics and the functions that support data collection, I came up with this new framework called mindful filtering, which brings together two separate, two seemingly uh, different practices, mindfulness and data uh, filtering. Um, and in, in coining this framework, I'm not really interested in um, the mindfulness, in how mindfulness can support um, recovery in refugee contexts, which has been studied elsewhere. I'm more interested in this question, can the philosophy behind mindfulness call into question the logics and functions of data filtering? And this is a very much work in progress, so I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about, about this framework. And so very briefly, um, just to give you a sort of a glimpse of what I mean by mindful filtering, uh, what well, is a practice and uh, meditation process, mindfulness encourages a, a sense of awareness of our actions and thoughts. And so mindful filtering invites uh, organizations to question and ask uh, the risk involved in collecting data without meaningful consent not just when a service is provided, not just when a solution is designed, but also when that service, that solution um, is uh, implemented um, in the moment and also in the long, in the long term. Um, and that is also the case for humanitarian technologies uh, or technologies that are used for humanitarian purposes. What happens when a solution is implemented? What happens after, after that is provided to, uh, to refugees? Are we, are we checking on that solution? Are we keep collecting data and how do we do that? As a practice as well that en encourages continuous uh, self-discovering, um, data collection, I argue, should also be constantly renegotiated. Consent uh, and privacy are not static, they're not fixed, uh, but they change. And so uh, humanitarians as well, as well as authorities should uh, call data into question, should ask whether data collection is always necessary, and should also ask whether a technological intervention is always the best solution. Um, and as a practice as well, mindfulness encourages a holistic understanding of the body and mind as interrelated elements. As we consider how data collection works and data filtering works, we can see how the collection of, um, of data, of refugee data for either political or humanitarian purposes, um, transforms the body into the refugee body, into an archive of information for identification and verification purposes. Um, it transforms into a, a digit of information. And so when it comes to the, to the body, uh, to the to technology, the body becomes a sort of subjected to a set of arbitrary decisions made by other people um, that don't really have always a clear understanding of what happens uh, on the ground. And so mindful filtering um, prompts the creation of a space um, of self-reflection where individual stories and needs are taken into account. Uh, and these are often actually considered to be now as a sort of plus data of no value, but also demands the involvement of refugees as uh, co-participants. Um, and as those who, as, 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 a, as a voice that needs to be accounted for. And this is particularly uh, clear in this final quote uh, from uh, a volunteer. Um, you need to build something easy and quick to prototype. You don't want anything too heavy because refugees don't have enough network or data. You need to keep this in mind. Sometimes you want to build something very fancy, but you need to ask who is the right user. User, how do you communicate with refugees? You need to have refugees on board. You need to find the right place for technology so that people can use it rather than having technology just because it's trendy. And so, Finally, my question becomes then in thinking about transformation of the public good, um, I want to open up these reflections and ask how can we use this framework of mindful filtering to rethink the delivery of public goods and social value in crisis context. As researchers, as volunteers, as activists, we need to commit more profoundly to the digital transformation um, of the notion of good. 
Um, and we need to commit to the value of difference that goes above and beyond the single actions to promote more inclusive politics of voice, which also includes the recognition of refugee voice as a fluid. And this is just a starting point, of course, but a point that I consider particularly uh, fascinating. So thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. That was bang on time. <laughs> thank you. Um, and it's amazing, again, kind of when, when you have this um, kind of very rich uh, kind of propositions one after the other, your brain starts to make connections. And I just find it so interesting, um, kind, of, kind, of, kind of the pro-social ideology is also kind of resulting perhaps in, um, in kind of the, the tech for, for good and how those connections are fascinating. So hopefully we'll have a lot to discuss. Okay, so now to our last um, speaker, um, Rebecca, you... Um, yeah, I'll share your screen. I think um, Joanna's yeah. going to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. Go for it. So thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about something a bit different. I'm going to talk about taxation, which, of course, has a critical relationship to the public good. So, Joanna, you could skip on um, to the next one. So we know taxes fund public goods like hospitals and state schools. And um, even after decades of neoliberal privatization, there's very few of us that think that the market can deliver certain types of public goods like critical infrastructure or national security at the moment. Um, we recognize that we need to pool our resources in order to deliver these goods. And those on the political left argue that the more we can commission and deliver goods and services on a collective basis, the better. Thinking beyond public goods from this more narrow economic perspective, Taxation is also understood by social theorists to contribute to the common good in a broader sense because it promotes contribution to and care for the welfare of others within our national community. My current research project, next slide please Joanna, uh, examines the frameworks of meaning that help people to make sense of taxation and public spending. And this includes questions of the public good. How is the public good understood? And I found that the concept of economic imaginaries is really useful to describe these frameworks of meaning. Imaginaries can be defined as semiotic systems that, that, that frame individual subjects lived experience. So when we talk about economic imaginaries, we're thinking about the systems that shape um, the economic field. So today I'm going to talk about digitalization as a critical development within our current moment and the role that it might be playing in organizing um, economic imaginaries. Digitalization has lots of different interfaces with practices of taxation. So I'm just going to give you some examples in the first part of the paper. And then in the second part, I want to talk about how do we analyze these developments. So um, without overemphasizing the role of technological determination, how do we speak about um, the impact that digitalization is having? So I want to use this example of the interfaces between digitalization and taxation to think about ways of approaching the digital. Um, and there's already, I can see a lot of connections to what we've already heard, so that's good. So next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about um, three interfaces. Um, I'm gonna talk about tax administration, and I'm gonna talk about changes in where, where value is produced. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some emergent alternatives to taxation. So next slide, please. We can start off with the digitalization of tax administration, a massive project in the UK at the moment. So tax administration, this is the, the mechanisms and processes that tax authorities use to collect taxes. And this is proceeding very rapidly around the globe, this digitalization of tax administration. And it's got a lot of different drivers, um, uh, notionally, including uh, efficiency, so reducing the cost of collecting taxes and compliance, so increasing the extent to which taxpayers actually comply with the rules. And in the UK, HMRC, um, the UK Tax Authority, argues that making tax digital will make it easier for taxpayers to get their tax right. So it's about making them feel good about themselves as taxpayers. Businesses with a certain turnover already have to follow these new rules. 
um, which include um, keeping certain digital records and using software to submit information to HMRC. But in the future, these rules are going to apply to the collection of uh, many other kinds of taxes as well. And as this graphic implies, the government has developed a range of digital tools that help support this drive to make tax digital. Next slide, please. So what's perhaps even more interesting is the fact that this, this state-driven digitalization agenda has led to the creation of a market, and we've seen markets being created in the other talks, um, but a market for digital record keeping and accounting and bridging software. So there are now lots of different commercial apps available which help small business owners meet the demands of these new rules. So in this advert, um, it, it's the owner of a fish and chip shop and she's being supported by QuickBooks software and it's being personified as an entire business department in her back pocket. So we can see the little people here who are all working for her inside the app. Next slide, please. Um, another driver of this commercial software market is precarious working because um, delivery drivers and other precarious workers are often classed as being self-employed and they have to complete a tax return. It's not a straightforward process. And so again, this has contributed to the proliferation of um, new apps like Untied, which promises to give um, gig platform workers, help them to manage their tax affairs more easily and more efficiently. So it makes big promises about how they can be supported. Um, sl uh, next slide, please. We also need to think uh, about where profit making is taking place in this context of digitalization um, or where value is being created. Zoe talked about the rise of digital platforms and services which operate across national boundaries. And this has raised urgent questions about international tax law, which is really poorly equipped to capture the profits that multinationals generate in countries where they don't have much of a, a physical taxable presence. So for example, Facebook or Amazon in the UK, for example. And the basic problem here is that there's a mismatch between where the profits are being taxed, most often in tax havens or low tax jurisdictions, and the place or, or the places where value is being created. So for example, where there are lots of Facebook or Amazon users like in the UK. Um, and there are some attempts to, to create new digital services taxes um, in the EU and in the UK as well, trying to address this problem, but it's very complex. Next slide, please. Uh, thinking again about where value is being created, um, we, several times we've heard about how the pandemic has accelerated digitalization and remote working. And um, law researchers have predicted that high income workers who may be employed by companies who offer fully remote working, um, there's a risk that they will increasingly engage in inter-jurisdictional working. So it might become increasingly common, um, in other words, for employees to live in a different tax jurisdiction from the one in which their employer is based. It's essentially this, this um, fantasy of the digital nomad. And this would have really serious implications for tax systems because it could lead to significant revenue loss for um, for certain countries, including the UK. Next slide, please. And a more extreme version of these digitally en enabled mobilities can be, um, can be identified in these kind of libertarian fantasies about exit from the authority of nation states and national tax authorities. So you may have heard reports about Satoshi Island, which is this plan to create an exclusive regulation free paradise in Vanuatu, where all the transactions would take place in cryptocurrency. So of course, there would be no taxation. Um, uh, next slide. And finally, we can think about how digitalization, and in particular, the development of the platform economy, again, to refer back to Zoe's talk, increasingly enables communities to supplement or fill gaps in the welfare safety net, which traditionally was delivered through taxation. Um, but I'm thinking of the rise of the crowdfunding economy, which has made it possible for individuals to fundraise for medical expenses and other basic needs. In some national contexts, these net needs were never met by state spending. They were never covered by the state. But in the case of the European welfare states, provision has been scaled back or maybe the right to access services has been removed from certain groups of people, um, such as refugees. So, okay, next slide. Um, 
so those are just some key developments. And of course, there's so many different interfaces between digitalization and taxation. So I'm going to talk now about how do we analyze these phenomena. Already by presenting my examples to you in this way, I've implied that it's digital technology and its application to practices of taxation that should particularly concern us. When we organize an argument in this way, it's very difficult to, to avoid a certain technological determinism or technological centrism. The implication that technology is the main driving force of significant social change, even if we're committed to the view that social change is produced through a really complex range of determinations. And I'm interested in this problem of how we can address digitalization in response to a particular social practice without overemphasizing technological determination. And I'm going to just mention some possible ways around this. They're not novel interventions. They're three approaches. We'd actually, they've all been mentioned already today, but I've been finding them particularly useful in relation to this particular research topic. So first of all, given my interest in economic imaginaries, I found it particularly valuable to think about the ideological investment in the digital that is indicated in these examples. And that's perhaps most obvious in the example of Satoshi Island, which literally describes a utopia facilitated by digitalization. But it's also present in all of the other examples as well. So next slide. If we go back to the example of making tax digital, this is apparently a much more neutral discourse of, of, of digitization. And it, we can see, though, that it's underpinned by this investment in transparency and efficiency. And um, I really like the work of the sociologist um, Kyle Wilmot, who's a Canadian scholar, who's shown how when it's mobilized as a technology of government, transparency can serve as a mechanism of moral scrutiny. Um, so in the Canadian context, he's talking about moral scrutiny of indigenous peoples. So part of my research on the interface between digitalization and taxation in the UK has focused on what are the ways in which digitalization is being harnessed to promote transparency as a tool of neoliberal governance. And this helps to draw attention away from digitalization in isolation and to focus on the broader political context. Next slide, please. Four minutes, Rebecca. Great, perfect. Um, we've talked about configuring social identities already today. And the role of digital technologies here is it's, it's the subject of a really lively debate, as um, Zoe showed again earlier today. Um, so if we go back to the example of crowdfunding medical bills, for example, um, do, do digital technologies and spaces nurture the formation of communities, um, new communities? Do they perhaps extend solidarities to distant others? Or do, in fact, online spaces merely replicate offline environments and the kind of unequal social formations in those offline environments, perhaps a neo-colonial relationship or a configuration of the deserving poor versus the, the undeserving poor. And as we've seen, one way through this that um, Sarah Anzo talked about is via this interrogation of the business models of platforms which design and host digital communities, which would help us to distinguish between more kind of grassroots and civic modes of engagement in non-profit digital spaces and those that are mobilized by financialized capitalism. However, I'm a bit cautious of over relying on this kind of alternative capitalist or state market binary for this analysis. Because I think looking at my examples, we can see there's this very distinct interpenetration between the technological practices that are being promoted by tax authorities, so by the state and by the commercial software industry. So it's not easy to unpick these relations, in fact. Um, OK, next slide. And I think um, at this point, a third approach is useful. And this is something that Sarah talked about, about um, affordances and Zoe did as well. And this is about the kind of interrogation of technological, but also social affordances. So we could think about this QuickBooks advert again, um, which I used to illustrate the rise of this commercial software market. Um, and we could think back to my earlier points about 
ideological investment and configuring social relations. And what I see in this advert and in this kind of example here, of the kind of subject that's being brought into being here in relation to this technology is a kind of extension of neoliberal subjectivation. So we see this female business owner who's positioned as this proficient, empowered, multitasking entrepreneur whose considered use of market delivered digital technologies is improving her efficiency and her productivity. And this positioning has really serious implications, of course, for her identity as a citizen and a taxpayer. An analysis which focuses on the technological affordances of the app might emphasize the extent to which these configurations are kind of baked into the design of the app. So they emerge from the social technical, socio-technical imaginaries that inform the development and production of new digital technologies. And so in this sense, they're kind of envisioned by, by um, their envisioned outcomes of the use of the app. But I think when we also bring in social affordances, we think about this gap between intended use of technologies and actual use of digital technologies. So it would be really nice, for example, to be able to do empirical research with female business owners. How are they using these apps? Um, how does it work in the context of their everyday experience of running their business? And how does it contribute to their subject formation? So that's a kind of rattle through some of the approaches that I found really useful in my preliminary inquiry into this question of digitalization. And it's my aim has really been about finding ways into approaching these interfaces between taxation and digitalization so that we, we retain a focus on the complex combination of cultural, economic, political and technological determinations. But this is very much work in development, so really keen to hear your feedback. Thanks, Alejandro. Excellent. Also bang on time. Well done. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for, uh, to the four uh, speakers. Uh, very kind of generative um, and, and deeply interesting talks. And of course, we can see the, the connections. Um, no wonder you're part of the hub. So we have kind of officially 15 minutes. So we don't have a lot of time. Um, I would like uh, first kind of to, to invite the, the attendees to perhaps uh, pose their questions. If you want to open your microphone, you can just raise your hand and uh, ask a question to the panel. Otherwise, you can also uh, text it in the chat, and um, and let's see how long we can we can go. Okay, perhaps while uh, people are typing their questions, if you don't mind, I'll use kind of my uh, authority as as a chair and kind of just ask a general question to the panel. I think there were some very very interesting connections, and one of the things that was quite admirable, I think, was uh, all of you kind of mentioned the recognition that the digital cannot be separated from the physical. That these connections need to be kind of recognized. Um, and one of the things that kind of I, I heard in 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 a couple of these presentations is the difficulty of measure what kind of what is obscured by this kind of pro social ideology. So um, thinking about kind of the digital move that uh, Befin was mentioning, um, kind of moving from you know, television to digital spaces, was there something lost in there? Kind of the local community perhaps was relying, is there kind of something in this trans uh, transversal citizenship that is lost with this push to digitalization and to kind of digital spaces? Something similar to kind of the idea of so on parasocial ideology. What does that ideology obscure? Is there perhaps a, a need for less connectivity or, ne or less sociality, is sociality perhaps even negative in a way? Um, and again, connected to this idea of perhaps all tech is for good and you kind of act straight away. So, I mean, perhaps I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but the question would be, how can we make those things that this sociality and this ideology makes invisible, how can we make them visible both as researchers, but also kind of as, as activists? Do we bypass their platforms? Do we engage them in the platforms? Do we create our own platforms? Kind of big question, but happy to hear uh, any possible answer. Maybe I can say a few things if, yeah, thank you. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, a very good point, Alejandro, in terms of understanding how this pro-social discourses or 
maybe ideology even works against actually establishing or re-establishing existing communities online via commercializing them, commodifying them. And maybe, again, digital device working against them at the same time. And I think in, in the case of um, I live in media, I can argue that this pushes um, content creators more broadly to be cross-platform. But it's very challenging if you look at either individual level or the community level to be on the cross-platform because it's not simply producing content and posting it, but responding to different um, digital architecture, going back to those point, um, against which these platforms are designed. So it's, it's in a way limiting, although it, it might be, um, yeah, it might be very promising. It might be considered very promising to begin with. So go for it. I mean, it's a really interesting question and I would love, I think that there's lots of commonality in the things that we've, we've spoken about. I have a couple of, of kind of thoughts and I think it's really important to think about what's obscured. Um, and I think even by the word good and public good, we, we are really in a moment, I'm reading this book by um, Shaku Banerjee, Social Media and Hate and Ramnath Bat. It's amazing, I really recommend it. Um, but in their um, conclusion, they talk about not just looking at um, individuals, but looking at uh, the ways in which systems work. They t argue for intersectionality and how social conditions determine these kinds of things. But also we are in a moment where good, you know, freedom, for example, and I think of the example of the Freedom Convoy, which is something we've seen in North America, you know, where there's an actual occupation. There was in Ottawa, which is one of my hometowns, by truckers and it's a freedom convoy. You know, they're like, we're being oppressed. We don't want to wear a mask. Um, so it's like a perversion. And, and I say this with thoughtfulness, it's a perversion of what freedom means. You know, it's it's a really kind of worrying moment, which uh, they pick up on as well. So I think that we really, that question, what is obscured? And it's not just by technology, it's by good, by freedom, by all these things that we would think of as positive. So I think I think that's one thing um, that it's really, really important to do that. And I, I've actually also been thinking, I kind of have this thought that um, be, meeting in person is a radical act, you know, meeting outside of platforms, outside of, and it, it, not such so as platforms, it's phones and um, the whole digital architecture and infrastructure, which we become so um, dependent upon. It is a radical act. It's radical in terms of how we connect, but it's also radical in terms of how monetization works. It's fascinating to hear about Rebecca's example, because when we think about, you know, the work by Nick Coldry and Ulysses Mayhas, and when they talk about in 2019, the cost of connection, they talk about the privatization of public knowledge, but not just public knowledge, public systems, you know, and this is exactly what we're seeing in the digital architecture. So I think, I think that questioning and challenging that privatization and having our social interactions um, and even our economic infrastructures, building from um, Rebecca's example is so important. Um, and lastly, sorry, this is this is a bit long, but there's a couple of examples of things for good, which perhaps are aligned with Sarah's. You know, Facebook has this data for good. It's I just recently discovered it, and it's all about map data and geolocation data. But it's used to you know um, uh, fight COVID and illness, and so that it's and it's puzzling to me what exactly is going on because of these dynamics. There's also some very interesting initiatives like um, the Data Trust Initiative, which tries to provide a cooperative model to how data is extracted. So this is public. It's circumventing the digital architectures and platform sorts of structures that we've looked at. So I, I, I'm very hopeful about it. But the issue is they don't have all of the money that platforms have. They don't have the armies of people working on seamless interfaces the same way with platform cooperativism. So I think there's some really exciting moments, but I think we have to be really, really critical about what good means and about the architectures we're engaged in. Great. Um, Sarah, perhaps you wanna come come uh, and kind of respond to what So mentioned, the whole idea that perhaps the intentions on this tech for good um, are are good. However, perhaps acting outside of mindfulness kind of kind of generate this trouble. 
is there is there a way for kind of the coders and the volunteers and the tech uh, you know the technologists to as you said kind of take a step back and and be mindful where will that impetus come from will it be from within do we need to put some pressure how will they kind of recognize that mindful filtering is something that they need to do Well, that's a good question. Um, it's something that the entrepreneurs and organizations I interviewed already realize. And I think that they are already realizing that, as, as I briefly mentioned, the technology is an enabler more than anything. So it does allow for a lot of things to happen, but only when these things happen in concert and in conjunction with more human uh, forces or um, a more mindful understanding of, of the social, political, cultural, and economic, as Rebecca said, conditions. And so I think that there is, within the context of the refugee crisis, after the kind of explosion of applications and services in 2015-16, slowly uh, some, uh, some techies, some, some members of the Tech for Good community are realizing that uh, another kind of reactivism needs to happen. And I think that it all starts with the with collaboration with the those who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of those services and solutions. So if you if you don't do that, especially when solidarity happens across borders, if you don't do that, if you if you don't reconnect with what happens on the ground, then it will be really difficult to find solutions that are impactful, which is the whole purpose of technologies for social change or technologies for social good. And I think that Rebecca mentioned something that really resonates with my research, um, the idea of the empowered entrepreneur, which is a very common narrative even within the refugee context, the idea of the uh, empowered the refugee with a smartphone uh, as an empowered and self-reliant individual, but that's only part of the story, and the story is way more complex than that, and in, it's more convoluted than that. And so, I think that as researchers, we have an opportunity, a real opportunity to just investigate uh, these complexities and these tensions by going back to the micro, going back to the lived experiences. Great, Rebecca, you wanted to answer to that? Yeah, um, I think just to go back to you, your first question, but connect it to what Sarah is saying as well. Um, I think one thing that we can do, I mean, I was gonna put a slide in my talk actually, that talks about with the digitalization of taxation, we're also seeing the disappearance of the material culture of taxation, because when you digitize something, you take something away so it's a way of answering your question really is that we can think about what is being taken away and why was it that according to this techno hype or techno utopianism what was wrong with that you know and it's not being luddite it's just saying well what what's the critique here of what what's gone and one of the interesting things about the material culture of tax tax is that it's very public so we used to for example have um, a piece of paper that you would stick in your car to show that you paid car tax, yeah? And now that happens online, it's completely invisible. So it becomes a much more private matter. And I think this fits in with, with what Sarah was saying just then about private individual selves who are autonomous and disconnected. So although we have this fantasy of digitalization as being, or the digital as being a, a, a space of connection, it can also be a space of disconnection and of a breakdown, a disintegration of public culture, um, just like Zoe was saying as well. So yeah, material culture is really important to reflect on. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's super mm -hmm. interesting how perhaps materiality also holds sociality. And once you move from the you know local television station to a digital YouTube page, you lose certain sociality by gaining something. Something I uh, I find very interesting and connected to some of my research and community media. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. I I think if if um, speakers and uh, kind of uh, attendees are happy to keep going, um, might we extend this for a little bit just to answer these questions? Okay, I take that as a yes. So let's start with the first question from FB6MLR. 
uh, that sounds like a bot, but I'm sure there's a name behind that. And this person asks, how would the panelists assess the recent success of messenger platforms like Telegram as a digital platform, which currently plays a big role for the Ukrainian refugees to organize and exchange information, which rivals the big tech established social media platforms? I think uh, so mentioned about how there are no platforms kind of uh, being created anymore. Perhaps um, is, is Telegram uh, kind of an outlier? And perhaps also that connects very well with uh, also what um, uh, Sarah had to say. So this particular technology in this particular uh, kind of case or, or um, tragedy, how, how do you assess their work? Perhaps how you want to start. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a great question. And um, I have kind of two answers, I suppose. It, not answers, but considerations before answering that. And the first is that, you know, so many kinds of media when they are new and even sometimes when they're not new are used to support refu refu not refugees, revolutionaries. You know, you look at tape cassettes in the Iranian revolution and they were instrumental in sharing information, you know, and this is not something we think of as digital or as exciting or interesting. So I think, I think that that, the people will use what they can when they can. Um, and that's one of the great things about these, these sorts of, about media. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, I think um, Telegram is being used in that way. And there's been other examples of uh, media being used in unanticipated ways in times of crisis. And there's many different examples of that. So I would argue that it's not actually rivaling in an economic, economic way or in terms of dominance, these other platforms. It's providing a much needed service to people in crisis. And that's awesome. And Telegram is a really interesting example because it's also encrypted. Um, it doesn't, so it's data extraction is very different and that's really interesting. So I think that that's, um, there is something. So, so just to say, you're really right to raise that. There's something very interesting going on there and it would be interesting to see what's gonna happen in Russia where the rise of censorship and the clampdown on independent media is, really severe so you know i think we will see some interesting ways um of communicating you know in, in china i think people change their words they use different kinds of language to talk about things in coded ways so yeah so i think i think watch the space will be interesting things um but it, it's a very interesting platform but i don't think it rivals the big ones sarah do you have something to add yes so it's a really interesting question. And I think that as media researchers, we need to pay attention to, to those practices and uses of everyday uses of technologies. The, the, the people, the refugees I've interviewed, they also, many of them, they used uh, Telegram as opposed to uh, WhatsApp, for example, to communicate. And, and for them, and I think this is a really fascinating dimension that we need to take, take more into account was about trust. And so I think that, you know, especially when it comes to sensitive information or sensitive data or sensitive conversations, more and more we are witnessing the, um, not the rise, but just the uh, frequency, frequency in, in use of alternative platforms that uh, users trust more. So I think it is the big thing for me that interesting to see and to look at is, how individual users trust the platform because in uses of platforms like Telegram, I think they do reveal uh, more kind of private, uh, personal alternative uses of technologies and um, and and it comes to, and it comes to yes to everyday uses again. And I, I talk about alternative uses. I define these alternative uses as strategies of tactics of resistance against uh, against uh, social media platforms in this case. But I think that a lot has to do with trust. And I think trust is also a dimension that is often, often overlooked when, when it comes to media studies or social media studies. And individual trust, uh, individual uses are, I think, a big part of the narrative. Oh, it's super interesting that you mentioned uh, trust, because if I can perhaps bring uh, the question from Teresa Pavliovac, sorry if I butcher that. Um, it's, it's a long question, but I think uh, at, the, at the heart of it is this idea of how, um, and I'm going to read here, um, listens to lots of students for countries where people do not trust their government, and there is a great belief in platform as an unregulated space. And um, she asked, how can we navigate this? And I think that's very interesting to see how perhaps 
the uh, distrust or the critical kind of uh, approach to to these platforms might be more readily available in certain kind of cultures and communities and, and societies than others. So I suppose, how can we understand these different imaginaries? Uh, she also mentioned how uh, Rebecca mentions this. How can we think of these imaginaries of trust and, and freedom in these platforms that we know have also their shortcomings? Um, I, I hope that is that I make, um, I made kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, that I didn't destroy your question, but yes, this, the, the question is how we navigate this tendency of students or people who perhaps in other countries do not trust established media um, and they kind of believe uh, on, on these platforms without also uh, infantilize them and said, no, you shouldn't trust these platforms because they are evil. So how does that kind of tension would, would you think uh, is a good way of, of thinking about it? Perhaps, uh, I don't know if Griffin or, or Rebecca will have something to say about that. Rebecca. It's a really good question. I can't see it written down, Teresa, but I think Alejandro's um, summary was great. Um, I think thinking about these imaginaries is really helpful. Certainly, I find it helpful. And um, we've already touched on a kind of imaginary of techno hype, techno utopianism. And that's really our way of, as critical scholars, of trying to describe something that we think is quite problematic about how technologies are imagined. But we have to recognize um, that there are competing imaginaries and that also these imaginaries are socially and geographically located. So um, I think that um, there are different imaginaries attached to, as she, as Teresa very clearly says, different imaginaries attached to technologies in different places. And, you know, I, I would love to see some more contemporary and more kind of nuanced research on emergent kind of competing techno imaginaries and what a geopolitical moment to try and think about that and to think about to go back to the previous question about ukraine about how these kind of geopolitical reconfigurations that are happening at the moment might start to um, really produce some different tendencies in the ways that people kind of attach to platforms and attach to you know their hopes and desires and dreams might attach to kind of the notion that their freedom or their future might be um, delivered in and through platforms. So it's a great question, isn't it? I don't have an answer, though. <laughs> you did a very good job at answering, though. Um, excellent. I, I mean, we are five minutes out, and I think um, some of our um, uh, kind of uh, some of the people here are, are starting to leave. So I, I think I would like to thank everybody for coming, for the people who uh, posted questions. I found this very, very interesting and revigorating. And it is obvious that there is um, kind of high quality research going on uh, at LCC, which of course we knew, but also that there is lots of um, kind of passion and, and activism behind this. And that is uh, very um, encouraging, particularly in these kind of hard times. So thank you everybody. Um, watch this space. I'm sure there will be other events like this. And um, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Great. Cheers. Thank